you've heard this, but for members who are here the first time this calendar year, I'd just like to take a moment to remind everyone that some new council and committee rules have come into effect. The new rules state that a member of the public who disrupts multiple council or committee meetings may be excluded from future meetings for one or more days. The number of days increases with the number of disruptions. The exact rules are available on the city's website and a summary of the rules are available on a poster board in the back of the room and right outside the doors of this chamber. I'd like to make clear that the new rules do not address the content of public speaker's remarks. Instead, the rules are designed to prevent repeated actual disruptions of council and committee meetings. The purpose of the rules is to help the council and committee meetings run more efficiently to complete the city's business and to allow as many, as many members of the public as possible to present their comments to their elected representatives in an orderly manner. Thank you for allowing me to notify the public of this, Mr. Chairman. Thank you so much. Uh, those uh, new rules are duly noted. They're posted in the back of the room, and uh, now we've heard them in a number of committees. Uh, I want to begin, uh, before we open up the meeting, to general public comment uh, by, one, announcing um, to those of you who have not uh, read uh, that this is the last meeting where I'll be the chair of the Homelessness and Poverty uh, Committee. Uh, we'll be, um, I will continue to be on the committee, continue to serve on this committee, uh, but at our next meeting, our chairman will be Council Member Mitchell Farrell uh, from the 13th Council District. So I wanted to take the opportunity at the beginning of this meeting just to thank everybody who's helped us uh, get through uh, my first uh, chair, chairpersonship of uh, any committee. Uh, I'm looking at our homelessness czar uh, in the corner who lets me call her, her, her the, our homelessness czar, even though she has another title. Uh, and all the folks at the CAO's office, uh, Rich Llewellyn, Miguel Santana, Yon Yolanda um, Chavez, uh, folks at the CLA's office, uh, our city clerk, uh, Mr. Villanueva, who's, who's normally with us, uh, as well as the city attorney. Also, um, uh, the co-chair that I started with, Council Member Jose Huizar, uh, who kind of, one, helped bring the committee into existence, but two, uh, help me co-pilot and, and help on-ramp me as I start on the council and and uh, help get this uh, help get our work around homeless organized uh, targeted and uh, strategic um, we uh, had a number of accomplishments I'll take a minute to talk about a couple three of them one uh, we were able to complete our homeless strategic homelessness strategic plan uh, for the city of Los Angeles we were able to do that in cooperation and collaboration with the County of Los Angeles, which I thought was a, a very, very big deal. Came up with 64 uh, strategies that uh, give us uh, guideposts and sort of lanes to push our work forward in uh, and to uh, evaluate the work that we're getting done uh, going forward. Um, and then we're excited, I'm uh, excited to co-author uh, Measure HHH on the Los Angeles Municipal Ballot uh, passed with 81% of the vote. Uh, the voters uh, decided to invest $1.2 billion uh, to uh, create 10,000 units of permanent supportive housing, and we've begun that uh, uh, process as well. Um, and we also worked alongside uh, leadership at the County of Los Angeles to pass Measure H, uh, which gives us hundreds of millions of dollars in resources to provide services. And so. When we started, we said uh, we needed both housing first to, to remove the condition of homelessness, um, and then we needed services uh, to prevent the condition of homelessness or treat the conditions caused by homelessness. And uh, we were able to put those measures in place and we're well along the way to um, beginning to turn the ship around on those issues. Uh, when we started, uh, I had lots of trepidation, as, as my colleagues will tell you, about taking on this committee. Uh, and some of you in the audience I had meetings with about it um, because there seemed to be no end in sight uh, to the homelessness problem. And in fact, it seemed like it was only going to get worse. Uh, last year, I'm very excited. Uh, I was very excited to one that was the first year in, in, in uh, a long, long time that we actually saw decreases. Uh, in the uh, homeless population, 19% decrease in veterans, homelessness, 18% decrease in uh, uh, chronic uh, homeless folks, uh, a 43% 40 increase in youth uh, placements. Uh, and so it just shows that the um, 
the public sector, uh, the government working together with the private sector, uh, and, and the private sector is very engaged in this issue from one end of the spectrum to the other. Um, you know, to my, my friends and, and neighbors and colleagues at uh, LA CAN, uh, to folks uh, down up the hill at the Chamber of Commerce and sort of everybody in between, including philanthropy, uh, everyday small business leaders, um, uh, folks in the legal profession, developers, all the rest, uh, folks have come together and put us in a position where we've actually begun to turn the ship around. And so uh, I'm very excited and proud of what we've been able to do and uh, look forward to what we, were what we will be able to do uh, going, uh, going forward. Um, lastly, I'll say that uh, Los Angeles laid down the marker with, with Measure HHH and, and Prop H, and now just this past November, the state uh, finally caught up to us and, and passed housing measures as well. And so uh, very grateful to, to all of you who've helped us, um, help me uh, through this process and uh, look forward to, to continuing to see it through. Mr. Chair. Mr. Bonner. During the entire time you've been chair, I've never missed an opportunity to speak. So yeah, why would I stop true. now? Uh, it, it, it's always, I think, for the audience, a little ridiculous when we compliment each other. But this is an occasion where I, I can't pass up the opportunity to do so. I want to uh, thank you for your leadership on this committee. Uh, I remember when you first took office and we sat down for the first meeting after you had been given this assignment, and we talked for a couple hours yeah. and uh, you didn't resign uh, <laughs> after that meeting and, and you kept going. Uh, you, you sort of enumerated some of the highlights, but when you started, we did not have a working relationship with the county. We did not have a strategy. We did not have funding sources and we weren't building things. And um, your <coughs> uh, it's because of your leadership that we have all of those things. And um, the, the thing that has really struck me is the collaborative and cooperative way you've worked with the rest of us on the council uh, to move forward on this. Uh, you're, you've been um, thoughtful and uh, uh, patient and principled and progressive in the, the way you've done something and I, I really admire how you've done this. And I want to thank you and Mr. O'Farrell has some very big shoes to fill. Thank you so much, that's very kind. We appreciate you, uh, Mr. Bonin, and so now we will uh, commence with our regular uh, business for this meeting. Uh, I have on the queue six people for general public comment. Four of you have filled out uh, cards for multiple items, and uh, those of you who have done that will be given two minutes to speak. Uh, I have Antonio Ramirez, uh, Herman, uh, Mr. Brown, and Mr. Vandenberg. Uh, all for two minutes each. That includes your public comment. Okay. Thank you. Public comments first, please. Ladies and gentlemen, again, I would like to tell you, being homeless is a mother of all mothers. The biggest problem that I encountered along with other females is the constant public safety issues. We get bombarded with violence, threats, um, assaults, and... Um, Theft, 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 and everything that they steal or vandalize, I have to replace the next day or buy it next day. I'm sick and tired. I hate being around junkies. God knows I hate being around junkies, and I hate being around gangbangers, and I hate being around wetbacks. I tell them, get the fuck away from me. Leave me alone. And then you get your few niggers every now and then, and they do harass you as well. And I say, you know what? I don't harass you. I don't fuck with you. Leave me alone. I get away from everybody, and I isolate myself because I don't want to be around them. There's only a few people of all colors that are decent, polite, and wholesome and beautiful. Those are the kind of homeless people I like to be around. But I don't like to be thrown into the gutter with these wetbacks, gangbangers, and these perverts and, and, and pedophiles and I'm not like that. I hate being thrown into with these maggots because this, that's not what I want to be in life. They are toxic. I don't do drugs. I don't drink. I don't smoke. I don't want to be thrown in with them. And that's exactly where they threw me in at the new bridge home in El Pueblo. And I had to end up getting out of there. I did their job, by the way. Who helps us? Nobody. The police won't go out of their way to help us either. So I have to run and catch my camera, chase the motherfuckers and go around and just go after them and tailing them. 
And that's what I do. And I get in trouble for taking their picture. Because the pussy Latinos, because Latinos are pussies. She took my picture, you know? And I say, fuck you, asshole. Get the fuck out of here. We're going to call ICE. This is what we go through every night and day. I like to be in an environment with civilized human beings of all colors. That's what I like. But I'm homeless. And the majority of these are motherfuckers. Don't trust these goddamn homeless assholes. God bless Herman. Well, you all, we're still looking for suitable and supportive motherfucking housing in L.A. But a nigga like me has to sweat and hustle my ass here to L.A. and fight for the rights of all Angelinos that are living in homelessness off of Skid Road, Boyle Heights, and the motherfucking Venice Beach East Side Coast niggas. And why is that? Because Mr. Bonin up there, that fucking drug addict Chango motherfucker up there, believes he's doing me a favor in providing suitable, affordable housing. But temporary support is not the solution, motherfuckers. The solution is to provide HHH funding to fix the fucking problem that fucking faggot mayor Eric Garcetti created in Los Angeles with Jose Weza who bought the fucking FBI here to investigate your so-called bullshit of development. All this gentrification of pushing a white nigga like me into the street motherfucker to cause me to come down here and argue with you son of a bitches about housing and affordable rent control suitable for those of us who fit the criteria of homeless crisis. So fuck Nancy Pelosi, that bitch from San Francisco with my new governor, fucking handsome Newsom. That motherfucking pokey toky should go with that dumbass mirror of ours and have Glenn Dake stick that DWP fucking white hose up his ass and wash his mouth out for creating the fucking bullshit we're living in today. I'm fucking sick and tired of seeing homeless people on the street, and I'm fucking tired of seeing the eyesores subjected by your fucking... That's your time. Uh, Please sit down immediately. Uh, So I have uh, Mr. Brown and Mr. Vandenberg. I don't see either of them. I have uh, Rabbi F. Rabbi here, I don't see the rabbi, and I have Dennis Gleason. So, Council District 15. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair and honorable members. As you all know, I'm the policy director for Councilman Joe Buscaino, but for the first time ever in nearly 10 years working in this building, I am here today speaking on my own behalf as a resident of Hollywood in Council District 4. Mr. Chair, 20 blocks from my home, 1,000 feet across our city limits into the city of West Hollywood. A serial killer is preying on young, homeless, black men of Los Angeles. His name is Ed Buck. He has donated to the political campaigns of numerous Democrats, including our new governor, and the stories of at least 12 witnesses who have come forward describe a man who is absolutely vile. Mr. Buck targets black men and black men only. He reaches out to men that are struggling, maybe couch surfing, might be homeless, occasional sex sex workers, often HIV positive, and he lures them over with the prospect of easy money without having to have sex. He he even flies in men from out of town. Some victims describe succumbing to pressure from Buck and allowing him to inject them with meth, while other victims describe succumbing, consuming a beverage that caused them to lose partial consciousness and waking up to find themselves restrained while Buck injected them against their will. I'm out of time, but I would like to submit for the record actual pages from uh, Jamel Moore's journal that describe what happened to him in the home of Mr. Ed Buck. Thank you. Uh, That's your time. Um, All right, so we have, um, if we could begin uh, the meeting with items uh, one through five, if we could read those into the record, uh, and I will take all the folks uh, doing public comment, we'll take those together. These are all uh, feasibility studies for bridge housing projects uh, throughout the city of Los Angeles. Items one through five. Yes, Mr. Chair. Uh, Richard Williams, city clerk's office. Item number one is motion 
for its Martinez relative to an instruction to the city administrative officer with the assistance of the CLA, Bureau of Engineering, Department of Public Works, Los Angeles Homeless Services Authority, and other affected stakeholders to evaluate the city-owned parcels at 1826, 1830, 1836, 1840, 1844, 1848, 1854, 1904, 1910, 1912, 1916, 1918, 1920, and 1924 South Cottoner Avenue and 11168 Missouri Avenue to determine if the properties are suitable for development as supportive or affordable housing, storage, safe parking, or use as part of a bridge home program and an instruction to the CAO to work with the council district on the best use of the properties and identify funding sources. Item number two is motion to D.O. Harris Dawson relative to an instruction to the CAO with the assistance of the CLA, Bureau of Engineering, Department of General Services, Los Angeles Department of Building and Safety, Los Angeles Homeless Services Authority, and any other affected stakeholders to evaluate the properties at 503 North San Fernando Road and 499 North San Fernando Road to determine if the properties are suitable for use as emergency shelter as part of a bridge home program and an instruction to the CAO to coordinate with the council district on community outreach and identify funding sources. Item number three is motion Wesson for Price Harris Dawson relative to an instruction to the CAO with the assistance of the CLA Bureau of Engineering, Los Angeles Homeless Services Authority, and any other affected city stakeholders to work with the Los Angeles Department of Water and Power to evaluate the Los Angeles Department of Water and Power owned property at 5874 Miramonte Boulevard to determine if the property is suitable for development as a crisis and bridge housing program facility and an instruction to the CAO to coordinate with the Los Angeles County to identify funding sources. Item number four is motion Huizar Harris Dawson relative to an instruction to the CAO with the assistance of the CLA, Bureau of Engineering, Los Angeles Homeless Services Authority, and any other affected city department or affected stakeholder to evaluate the properties at 442 South San Pedro Street, 2426 East Washington Boulevard, 606 East 6th Street, and 540 Town to determine if the properties are suitable for providing crisis bridge housing and or other crisis response facilities and to identify funding sources and an instruction to the Department of General Services to identify an on-site homeless services operator and negotiate terms of a lease. And item number five is motion Harris Dawson's adio relative to an instruction to the CAO <coughs> with the assistance of the CLA, Bureau of Engineering, Los Angeles Homeless Services Authority and any other affected city stakeholders to evaluate the properties at 5533 Southwestern Avenue and 5525 <coughs> Southwestern Avenue to determine if the properties are suitable for development as crisis and bridge housing facilities and an instruction to the CAO to coordinate with Los Angeles County to identify funding sources. Excellent, thank you so much. So these are um, five uh, sites being looked at for uh, bridge housing and or uh, permanent supportive housing possibilities. Uh, we'll get a report back on uh, these sites in the coming uh, weeks. Uh, there are actually no public comment speakers on any of these items, uh, so if there's no discussion, uh, I don't see any discussion, we'll take those items on consent. And before we move to item number six, uh, I wanna recognize uh, that we've been joined by Council Member Price of the 9th Council District. Item number six. Item number six is motion Bonn and Harris Dawson relative to an instruction to the CAO with the assistance of the Department of City Planning, City Attorney, CLA, along with any other relevant agencies or departments in consultation with the management and board of directors of the Disability Community Resource Center to evaluate the property at 12901 Venice Boulevard to determine its suitability for development as permanent supportive housing and continued use as headquarters and independent living center by the Disability Community Resource Center and an instruction to the CAO to provide options and make recommendations for the process to develop such a proposal. All right, we've got uh, one public comment speaker on this item uh, and then we'll hear from Mr. Bonin. Mr. Pete White. Uh, 
Uh, this is really quick. We're just, um, my name is Pete White from the Los Angeles Community Action Network. We are uh, in support of moving forward the proposal on item number six um, for the permanent housing side on 12901 Venice Boulevard. We think that this council, we think that this committee should spend a whole lot more time um, looking for securing sites for permanent housing. Um, we still, and will continue to say, bridge housing sites um, or the bridge housing construct continues to be a bridge to enforcement. We think the only way to solve this crisis is with housing of all types, and this is the way to move in that direction. Thank you. Mr. Bonner? Uh, just real quickly, obviously, urging that we approve this uh, as, a, as a site for examination for permanent supportive housing. It's a little different than most of the, the city parcels we've seen. Uh, this one in Mar Vista actually is 90% owned by the city and 10% owned by the Disability Community Rights Center. Uh, it's a deal that goes back to, like, I think the Pat Russell days back in, in, in the 80s. Uh, so we need to structure this a little bit differently, and uh, it's an ideal opportunity to build permanent supportive housing that, that serves people with disabilities. So we may need to look a little bit more creatively on how we structure it, but it's a good thing to do. Excellent. Uh, hearing no objection, we'll approve that matter and go on to item number eight. Item number eight is exemption pursuant to California Environmental Quality Act guidelines 15301, 15303, 15311 and 15332 and government code section 8698.4a for and motion Rodriguez Bonin relative to the transfer and appropriation of 723,000 <coughs> for the operation of the bridge housing project proposed for the Silver Armory at 12860 Arroyo Street and an instruction to the CAO to submit to the Homeless Strategy Committee for review of funding allocation of three million for the capital and operating support for short-term housing intervention and capital for permanent housing, homeless emergency aid program line item to fund operations of the Silmar Armory. Excellent, uh, we got no speaker cards on this. I don't know if uh, you wanna make any comments on this, Councilwoman. Now I'm just looking forward to getting this bridge housing site operational. Um, it's, uh, you know, we're, we're making some uh, very swift progress in the Northeast San Fernando Valley, and I'm grateful for the partnership and collaboration uh, that we have with, the count with our county partners. It's helped us to accelerate uh, in a very meaningful way facilities that are actually accommodating and providing shelter for, for uh, this critical population. And so just ask for your eye vote. Excellent. Thank you. Hearing no objection, that'll be the order. That uh, will take us to item number 11. Item number 11 is motion price Harris Dawson relative to an instruction to the Los Angeles Housing Community and Investment Department with the assistance of the CLA to report within 12 days with an analysis assessing the feasibility of providing additional subsidies or more favorable allocation terms to high and highest opportunity areas to ensure the equitable distribution of funding for Proposition HHH projects throughout the city. Thank you so much. Again, no uh, com public comment speakers uh, on uh, this <coughs> item. Uh, Mr. Price, I don't know if you had any comments on this. Excellent. Thank you so much. Uh, so hearing no objection, that'll be uh, the order uh, and then we'll move to item number seven. seven. Item number seven is motion Rue Harris Dawson relative to an instruction to the CAO with the assistance of the CLA, Bureau of Engineering, Los Angeles Homeless Services Authority and any other affected city stakeholders to evaluate the city owned property at 15314 West Dickens Street Los Angeles Department of Transportation lot number 762 in conformance with the procedures set forth by the city's asset evaluation framework and work with the California Department of Transportation to determine if the property is suitable for development as permanent supportive housing 
and an instruction to the CAO to also evaluate the site at 5161 Sepulveda Boulevard as a crisis and bridge housing facility and to coordinate with Los Angeles County to identify funding sources. Uh, all right, uh, I have uh, one public comment speaker on this. Uh, it's Mr. Pete White, but uh, we've been, uh, there's a request from Council District 4 to continue this matter uh, to a date to be determined. So if there's no discussion or objection, uh, that'll be the order. And, uh, and we will uh, move on to item number nine. This is the one. Item number nine is Homeless Strategy Committee Transmittal relative to the Homeless Emergency Aid Program, i.e. HEAP funding recommendations. All right, I think we have a report from our homelessness czar. Welcome. Good afternoon, Meg Barclay, City Homeless Coordinator um, from the Office of the City Administrative Officer. So the report before you today provides the status of the HEAP grant and recommends new allocations and, rec and reservations of HEAP funding as recommended by the Homeless Strategy Committee from their December 20th meeting. With the amendment provided, the report at, uh, that's been circulated today, the report allocates a total of $22,702,325. Um, table one on page four of the CAO report attached to the transmittal provides the status of HEAP funding as of October 2018, which was the last time that we provided, or the, the, the last set of HEAP recommendations that were approved. Um, the, Recommendations in the CAO report are based on a process of uh, receiving requests through council motions and letters from city departments. And as of December 20th, 2018, we had received $73.7 million in requests for HEAP funds. Most notably, $60.2 million of that was for the $11.4 million remaining in category four, category three, excuse me. Um, additionally, the need for a bridge home sites was beyond what's currently funded. Um, Beyond what's currently funded is $51.5 million, and that is laid out a little in more detail on uh, table three in page six of the CAO report. Since the requests were far in excess of the funding that we had available, um, we had recommended prioritizing HEAP funding based on, at, sort of as followed according to these priorities. Uh, first, prioritizing interim housing beds through um, and the Abridge Home Program. Second, hygiene services, a third priority to extinue, continue and expand multidisciplinary teams, and the last priority being services for homeless families. As it relates to interim housing, um, $29.6 million uh, had been committed to the Bridge Home Program to date for, uh, from the three Abridge Home sources, and as you recall, there's $45 million for a Bridge Home in the HEAP Program, $20 million that was allocated through the city budget through the Crisis and Bridge Housing Fund and general funds, and an additional $10 million um, in the unappropriated balance made available for a bridge home and other homeless services. The, um, and as I said before, the total remaining estimated need um, against that $29.6 million, or sorry, the remaining need was $51.5 million. So with funds from the $45 million, the three sources that I just um, state, uh, that I just described, and additional uh, funds that we have recommended in this report for eligible <coughs> projects from categories two and three, there's, or two and four, there's still a three and a half million dollar shortfall to be able to fully fund all of the bridge home sites that we are, have, um, have had motions approved. So as such, we're recommending that all of the funds in the bridge home sources, as well as the three, uh, three million five hundred $13,921 in category three be reserved for the bridge home sites that are described in the report. Additionally, um, our report recommended funds, the, the um, eight Homeless Strategy Committee, excuse me, recommended funds for um, staff at the General Services Department and also a bridge home contingency fund to address um, and to expedite projects and respond to issues as they arise. We've We've um, noted the need to have a flexible funding source to be a little bit more nimble in responding to issues. As it relates to hygiene services, we're recommending uh, about $7 million from categories two and three to continue and expand the pit stop program, adding sites in Skid Row, um, Council Districts 1, 9, and 13, and adding a mobile shower component in um, 
cooperation with the county. So the county has some mobile shower trailers that they're willing to let us use free of charge if we can, so all we need to do is pay for the services and the attendance to um, work with those shower programs or those shower trailers. Uh, we also recommend funding to continue the multidisciplinary team in Council District 8 and add a new multidisciplinary team in Council District 9 and um, services for homeless families in Council District 6 and 7. Um, there's a recommendation for $114,568 for North Valley Caring Services to build capacity and hire full-time staff. And with the amendment that I referred to before, there's an additional $450,000 recommended for Family Navigation Center Services for North Valley Caring Services. And that is um, out of a $1.1 million uh, recommended by the, the Homeless Strategy Committee. So the balance of that of that $1.1 million or $650,000 is recommended for Los Angeles Family Housing and other partners to provide dedicated services to homeless families living in hotels and motels along Sepulveda Boulevard. The recommendation also, um, sorry, the amendment also recommends instructing LASA and the City Homeless Coordinator to report with recommendations to for an additional $450,000 and provide program and reporting recommendations for that, for that program in CD6. Uh, we also recommend expanding prevention and diversion specialists at City Family Source Centers, um, and that's to be supported with funding from HEAP and additional general fund savings um, from LASA from prior years. The HSC had also requested clarification regarding recommendations relative to a litter abatement pilot program re re requested by Council District 15. At this time, because the, first of all, because of the really excessive requests for funding, but also because this program is um, aligned very, very tightly with the goals of the LA RISE program administered by EWDD, we recommend that the department report back with recommendations and budgets for this pilot, um, including options for geographic scope to have the pilot implemented through um, the LA RISE program. <coughs> so um, that summarizes the transmittal from the Homeless Strategy Committee. Um, there are also some amendments that I've circulated in response to some needs for corrections since the Homeless Strategy Committee acted, and also recommendations and requests from council offices. So if, if you'll indulge me, I'll, I'll summarize those for the record, um, but they have been distributed in writing to the clerk. So um, we would recommend amending uh, recommendation 2A2 to reallocate funds for furnitures, fixtures, and equipment at the Bridge Home site on Schrader Boulevard to allow the city to purchase the mattresses for the site rather than the provider um, using a, a newly procured contract. Uh, we'd recommend changes in category three to, ex, um, to reallocate funds for one of the two new mobile pit stops for, that, are, that were recommended by HSC for, um, in CD1 and to reallocate that funding to expand um, Shower of Hope mobile shower services in Council District that are currently operating in Council District 1 from two days to five days per week. And that reallocation is in the amount of $399,596. Um, thirdly, we recommend the, the, rec the amendment that I had um, alluded to before would be to directly allocate $450,000 um, that is addressed in recommendation 2C5 for North Valley Caring Services and um, the recommendations I summarized before to use the remaining $650,000 for LA Family Housing. <coughs> um, we'd also recommend adding $326,667 from Activity Category 4, which is the youth set aside, to um, correct the total amount needed for the Aviva Family Children's Center's construction. Um, to, this funding was needed for construct, construction contingencies and it was excluded from the original budget. Additionally, we recommend $325,000 for Valley, or sorry, for Venice Community Housing Corporation for down payment to purchase a property currently being leased for the Roots to Grow program. And we'd recommend um, amending recommendation six to authorize the CAO to execute a contract with the Valley, or sorry, Venice Community Housing Corporation to purchase the property subject to um, confirmation that all other necessary acquisition financing is in place at the time that the, the funds are provided. Um, sorry, excuse me. We would, the other, these all, all these recommendations make some adjustments to, um, I apologize. I skipped a couple of things. 
<laughs> recommend $445,000 from Category 5 to support a fellowship program, the Homeless um, Policy Fellowship Program at the United Way of Greater Los Angeles. Um, and again, that the CAO be instructed to execute the contract with the United Way for those funds. And uh, these result in some changes to the administrative costs for LASA. So that changes amended, amends recommendation 2E1 to change the administrative amount for LASA from $207,742 to $227,056. $227,056. And that changes the amounts for the bridge home contingencies. So the transfer from category five to category one should now be $2,565,876. Um, and that changes the amount of the bridge home contingency fund to $2,289,626. Uh, we also need a recommendation to uh, recommendation 5A3 to list the Los Angeles County Department of Health Services as the recipient of the funding for the multidisciplinary teams rather than HOPICS, they're the um, agency that holds that contract. Um, this changes total activity categories. Um, from category one, total allocation is $6,307,777. From activity, activity category four, the total is $1,000,000. $332,755, and from category five, it's $1,005,126. Um, we also recommend that HCID be authorized to execute a new contract with LASA rather than amending the existing contract for the HEAP funds to allow them to keep these funds separate and account for them separately from the general fund contract that they already have with LASA. And the amendment provides the um, new spread of total funds committed across the five HEAP categories. That concludes my presentation. That concludes your report, all right. <laughs> Looks like there's more. But wait. I believe that you have, are you, um, the, the last, the, um, excuse me, the Homeless Strategy Committee had um, pa passed on recommendations relative to three staff um, in the mayor's office $544,000 for three staff in the mayor's office without recommendation. So today, if that is your, um, if that is, is, sorry, if that is your decision, we would, we would recommend moving forward with that funding. Got it. All right, members, uh, I know there's a good amount of discussion on this. I've got five uh, public comment speakers on the queue. If uh, folks don't mind, if we can run through those. Hang tight. Uh, yeah. Yeah, just hang tight. And then we can get the five public comments, and then we'll go into... Uh, discussion uh, from the members Pete White, Craig R, Nina Sanford, Steve Good, and Dave Bates in any order. Can I'm uh, and by the way, congratulations, uh, Marquis and. Uh, on your years, uh, your year as a chairman, and uh, I'm glad to hear that you'll be remaining on the subcommittee even while no longer being chairperson. I'm, I'm wondering about the lack of <coughs> urgency on the part of Meg Barkley and others in terms of the specific heat funding being the $20 million, once known as the Skid Row Emergency Response Fund. They seem to be generating ideas for spending uh, or allocating about a quarter of it, but uh, no plans for to meet the urgent needs of those in Skid Row, other than uh, spend 4.6 million and then bank the rest. Uh, is that what's going on? Okay, we can get to that. That's a good. We'll note that question and ask her to come to it. Okay. Thank you. Okay, that that's my question. Lack of okay. urgency to meet the needs of uh, people on Skid Row now. Got it. Thank, Thank you. you. Come on, don't be shy. Now's your moment. Hi, um, I'm Nina Sanford. I'm a pit stop ambassador. I wanted to tell you a little bit about how it's helping me and helping the community. I was three years a chronic homeless before I got the job. And when I got this job, it helped me learn how to be a part of the solution instead of part of the problem. Uh, I deal with homeless people every day. 
I um, <coughs> hear their stories of how they've been out there and I tell them mine. And um, I think that the fact that uh, Pit Stop is there, it's a godsend to all the homeless people because I wish it would have had it around when I was homeless. Um, being able to just a God-given right to go to the restroom in peace and safe and clean, it's, it's a godsend to the people. And I touch everybody's heart every day with goodness and good intentions because this job is a blessing to me as well as the community. Thank you. Thank you. Which pit stop are you assigned? Which pit stop are you assigned? I'm assigned to the one on Alvarado by the Wonderwood Freeway and to Santa Monica and Vermont. Hi, my name is Steve Good. I'm the executive director of Five Keys. Uh, Five Keys is primarily known in LA for the education programs that we run in the county jails. Uh, however, we're also the subcontractor under Hunters Point Felony that runs the Pit Stop program in LA. I just wanted to mention that of the 55 employees we have that work for the Pit Stop program, 90% of them are ex-offenders. Uh, a very high percentage of them as well are formerly homeless. That Pit Stop, this job has afforded them the possibility to move into housing, um, our employees in this program also receive um, excellent health benefits, the same benefits that I receive and our executive team and all of our employees receive. Uh, on top of that, we work with our pit stop employees to help them find housing as well. The homeless employees that we have, we partner with LA Mission to get them housing um, in their programs. So it's a twofold. Not only are we helping ex-offenders get uh, permanent employment, but we're also doing, as Nina described, a great service for LA. Good afternoon. I'm Dave Bates. I'm the uh, director of reentry for Five Keys School and Programs. I have the uh, object of a lucky job. I get to oversee the pit stop here in Los Angeles. So I oversee those 53 people. But it's an interesting job because I'm not just overseeing 53 employees working as ambassadors. I actually have the, uh, the luxury to work with the homeless uh, population as well. So what we're doing here in Los Angeles by giving those people some dignity with those public restrooms and putting folks back to work, it, it's a true pleasure. So I just wanted to share that with you. I mean, I really feel like it's a lucky role to be in. Thank you. Thank you. Craig R. Craig, you already spoke? OK. That's, uh, Craig said he's been there and he's done that. So. Again, my name is Pete White, LA Community Action Network. So with the stench of corruption clouding the corridors of City Hall, confirming what we all know to be true, now is not the time to play with the lives of LA's most maligned communities. The CAO's heap report and spending recommendations, especially for the $20 million Skid Row Fund, is nothing less than an exercise in absurdity. Case in point, the current recommendations um, that we saw was $2 million for a sidewalk sweeping program, $350,000 for 24 new trauma-informed care beds, which we support at the Downtown Women's Center, and $1.1 million for administrative set-aside for LASA, the Board of Public Works, and the Mayor's Office topping the list at nearly uh, $500,000 all to the tune of $4.5 million while leaving $15.5 million on the table. Um, we are resubmitting our community-based recommendations for prompt inclusion in the amended report for the public health infrastructure as it's a must. So if someone could take this, we actually submitted this letter on September 13th, 2018. Uh, and it details public health infrastructure needs in Skid Row and not this $4.6 absurdity. Thank you. Uh, okay, uh, let's uh, begin our conversation. Um, Ms. Barkley, I'll, I'll let you respond to public comment and then uh, we'll go to members uh, starting with Mr. Price and moving left. All right. So as it relates to the Skid Row set aside, there's been a motion introduced by uh, Mr. Huizar related to looking at a number of properties on, on in the Skid Row <coughs> area to establish interim housing or access centers. Um, which with with these funds and so actually staff are going out to those sites next week to tour them they're all privately owned and um, look at what the potential might be for for establishing services in those sites and um, what the need from the skid row set aside uh, would be so 
for those for those purposes. Okay. Any, that's, any others comments based on what you heard? Mm, no. Okay. All right, Mr. Price. Yeah. about the MTDs, it's uh, multiple disciplinary teams, what they're going to do, what they're doing differently, what we learned in the past, and are we incorporating anything new or just more <laughs> money, more time, more efforts? What's going to be different? So, so as you know, the funding both from the city and the county for outreach teams has increased significantly since um, Measure H and Proposition HHH <coughs> were adopted. Uh, there's a number of different types of teams. Most prolific are the... Um, homeless, sorry, homeless engagement teams or HETs that are administered through the Los Angeles Homeless Services Authority, which are um, general outreach workers that go out in teams to um, meet people on the street, um, try and help them get connected to services, but may have not have a, a large list of really specialized services to be able to provide services in the field. The multidisciplinary teams are con consist of um, additional specialized services, a nurse practitioner, a, a licensed clinical social worker, and I can't remember, there, there is um, a person with lived experience, and I can't remember the other component of the team. However, the, they are um, a more specialized team that are able to actually provide services in real time in the field. It's really important that we have a mix of these two different types of, of teams for being able to get as many people out there as possible, but also be able to provide what much needed services where they're needed when when they're needed and so these two the team that's been operating in cd8 and the new team in cd9 will be able to complement other outreach services that are already happening in those areas and how many are on each team i believe it's four or five it's in the hold on just a second i'll check it's in the report They have a general outreach worker, a nurse practitioner, a psychiatric social worker, a substance abuse specialist, and a person with lived experience. So five people on each team. And I see we're expanding the mobile shower uh, program, or at least making it more available mm -hmm. in other locations. So the mobile showers actually, um, what we're recommending uh, for in, in connection with the pit stop program is to use two of the county owned mobile shower units this year, one of them being dedicated to Skid Row and one to be serving the other pit stops that are outside of Skid Row. So the Board of Public Works is working with Five Keys and Hunters Point Family, who is the prime contractor for the pit stop program to determine the deployment schedule for, they're already talking about how to get those um, showers out into the field and rotate them among the pit stops that are um, operating both inside of Skid Row and, and outside of Skid Row. In the second year, the county is making another two trailers available to the city, so there will be four trailers in operation in the second year. Great, thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Mr. Rodriguez. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Meg, thank you. Um, this is quite a heavy load here uh, to, to carry. Um, and uh, and I'm, I'm really excited about the work that we're doing with North Valley Caring Services. Uh, you know, we just piloted the, uh, the safe parking with them, and the augmentation and expansion of services here is going to be really an, the, the next step for us, so uh, I'm, I'm really excited about this. But in terms of all of the submittals that were received for, uh, for funding, were each provided, or each did each come with the scope of services uh, outlined in such a way that we could help monitor whether or not they're going to be able to fulfill it by a certain date so that we don't potentially jeopardize losing the funds if they go unspe uh, unspent. Yeah, so some um, proposals had different levels of information at the, at the outset. However, we met with every council office that had introduced a motion or departments that had uh, provided, that, that had sent letters regarding the, um, with requests to, to get more information about those requests and received a lot more information behind what was provided as a part of the initial submission. Okay. So we feel comfortable that we that we have 
the, the scope that we need and where we don't, we, there's their recommendations to come back with additional information around. Programs. So is there a check-in point that we're expecting so that we can make sure that they're being, the funds are being expended so that we don't potentially jeopardize not, if they're not fulfilling that we could potentially uh, assure that we could reallocate those funds for yeah. uh, another use? So the CAO is the grant administrator for the HEAT program and we will be monitoring expenditures very closely and reporting regularly on the status of the fund. Okay. Thank you so much. Sorry. So Mr. Bonin. Uh, thanks for the work on this and doing all the detailed slog through meeting with every council <laughs> office and getting into the weeds on, on, uh, <clears throat> on each project. Uh, and I'm <coughs> fine with the recommendations today and appreciate the additional amendment regarding the, uh, uh, the VCH uh, youth housing project. Um, I, d I do just want to note, though, that, that I'm uh, disappointed that we're missing an opportunity to take some action on shared housing. Uh, I was afraid that we would start spending the money before we <coughs> finished the analysis on shared housing and started giving it the financial support, and that's where we've got it. Uh, now, I'm encouraged there's more state money coming, and I'm absolutely determined, at least in my district, that we spend some of that on shared housing. I, you know, I, I'd like a million dollars for shared housing uh, uh, with my bridge housing. Uh, and as I said when we discussed it here last time, uh, that's, that's a bargain. Even if we only house three people with it, and I think we would house a hundred, uh, that's, that, that's more than we would get for spending a million dollars on permanent supportive housing. Um, so I'm going to be continuing to push for that when the next uh, bunch of money comes through um, uh, because I think it's an investment we need to make. I mean, some people can get off the street today and some people not only could have a roommate, some people need a roommate. It's, it's a therapeutic environment for many people that living alone uh, is not appropriate for. So I just want to note that we're what we're not taking action on today that I, I, I underscore that we need to take action on. The other thing is I'll uh, speak very briefly to uh, the, the, the note uh, that uh, Yolanda passed about the, the funding for the mayor's office, which didn't get a, a recommendation. Uh, <coughs> I'll move a, approval of that. Um, you know, I always hate spending money on administrative costs, but uh, the city's doing a lot. And I've seen firsthand in the work we've tried to do on, on bridge housing in my district how uh, how uh, invaluable the mayor's office uh, has been in helping with that. And, you know, I've got 75 issues on any given day, and each of my deputies is juggling dozens of them. We need people who are focused solely on this mission, and uh, I, I have seen firsthand that the, the mayor's resources on that have been well-focused and helpful, and so I'm supportive. Excellent. So I'll second Mr. Bonin's uh, recommendation on uh, the administrative uh, allocations. Um, just a question about the state uh, program and how we're um, operating in relation to it. I know you talked about us moving money from category to cat from different categories based on what our needs are. Sort of. Uh, how does that? Uh, how does that get reported to the state? Do they find out at the end? Do we t do we tell them now? Are we giving them guidance about? Uh, what's needed and what's going to be needed around the state because we're the biggest laboratory. Yeah, we will definitely be, once the, these recommendations are approved by um, the council, we'll be reporting to them the, the funds that were, have been committed through the council action so that they have a sense of commitments. They don't have a formal structure set up yet for reporting around um, the commitments and expenditures, but we expect guidance on that and we will be working closely directly with the state uh, to make sure that they are aware that, of what what Los Angeles is doing with the funding and also just how it's how it's being spent, the status uh, and, of expenditures. And then uh, you pointed out we still have somewhat of a gap in our bridge housing uh, program. We filled some of it through, mm -hmm. through uh, the things you laid out today. Uh, can you tell us something about how we expect that to get filled? Because uh, it seems like that pro that program, which is I think a good thing. Uh, is oversubscribed already. Um, in the beginning, there was a concern that people wouldn't want bridge housing <laughs> sites in their district. Uh, and now, thankfully, we have the opposite problem, but I want to actually make sure we're able to meet the demands uh, that are coming forward. 
Yeah, it's a happy surprise. Yes. So um, the, the report, the recommendations before you today would actually either allocate or reserve enough money to pay for the projects that we have feasibility motions on that have been approved and are, are likely to move forward. And so those are described in, give me a second. Um, those are described in table three on page six of the report. Um, and so we have, if, if the report is approved, we would have enough funding for the projects that are listed in both, yeah, in tables two and table um, three. So table two has the funds that have been approved or were pending approval, including SOMAR, which um, you just approved the feasibility motion for today, but also the other projects <coughs> that are in the pipeline um, and at various stages of assessment, but that we know the, um, that we know these are feasible and that we have an estimated cost for. Uh, so assuming that, that these, these numbers hold, the recommendations today would set aside enough money to pay for these sites. There's an additional, uh, we understand a motion may be forthcoming on a project in CD6, so that, that one is on the waiting list at this time. Um, however, if there, is, if there is a motion introduced for that one, we would need to find some funding to um, but that is the only one that we are aware may potentially come forward that doesn't ha that isn't included in the funds that are set aside in the report. Uh, okay, thank you. And then and then this this uh, wait list. Uh, how do you what do you think is sort of the top three ways that we'll deal with that? So the wait list is established to give us some guidance on you know how to uh, if if projects in this in this heap allocation that we're recommending today. For example, were to fall through, this would give us a list of projects to go to. Um, they're not, aside from looking at needing to make sure that we have funding if we need it for a bridge home operating or other types of bridge home, uh, w consistent with the priorities recommended in this report, the, um, the projects on the wait list aren't in any priority order, but it does give us a list to start with. Um, if there are, uh, as um, Councilwoman Rodriguez referred to, if there are projects that may not end up being able to spend the money or that fall through for any other reason, uh, we have a list of projects to go to as a starting place. So Excellent, thank you. I, I would just uh, point out uh, before we uh, go to a decision on this, uh, one, I appreciate your work, appreciate you uh, sort of slogging through and figuring out uh, what all the council districts wanted and also uh, we'll note and appreciate you for taking all the incoming uh, in the last, I don't know, 72, 96 hours uh, as we were coming to a vote on this. I know a lot of new things emerged uh, or changes came to, came up and it seems like you're able to catch all that and, and put it in front of us today. So we're very grateful for that. It, um, thinking about the bridge housing program as a centerpiece here, uh, because of the situation we have in Los Angeles where you know whether it was Sherman Oaks or Venice or Koreatown or San Pedro, uh, you know, we encountered a lot of resistance in the beginning. Uh, and then uh, um, um, communities slowly are embracing them. The last thing we want to have happen after we've gone through a process like that mm -hmm. is not to be able to deliver on the projects uh, and not to be de able to deliver quality projects uh, that have the good neighbor policy as uh, Councilwoman Rodriguez so brilliantly put forward. Uh, we got it, we just got to get this right. Uh, and it seems like a big chunk of the resources to help us get this right is coming from this pot. And so yeah. we ask you and your team to keep a close eye on it and the, and the projects um, so that we do it right and we make good on the promises uh, that were made to folks uh, in the city of Los Angeles. So uh, with that, uh, if there's nothing further, uh, so we have a a uh, motion in front of us with a series of amendments, uh, which we'll accept all of them as uh, friendly. Uh, can you give us an overview of, of what's in front of us? Maybe not as exhaustive as what Ms. <laughs> Barclay did, but a summary of what we're uh, making a decision on today. Um, <clears throat> Richard Williams, City Clerk's Office. Uh, what you have before you is the CAO's original report. I'm sorry, the Homeless Strategy Committee's original report, the CAO's um, amendments as um, summarized by Ms. Barkley from the CAO's office, 
and and the recommendation to approve 9A in the HSC transmittal relative to the um, the mayor's the funding yes. for the administrative position for Mr. Bonner's uh, motion amendment. And just to clarify, um, the other additional recommendation in addition to the funding is the instruction to the Economic and Workforce Development Department to report back relative to the um, litter abatement pilot. Just to be sure. Okay. Uh, all right. Uh, if there's no further discussion, uh, the item has been moved and seconded. Uh, hearing no objection, uh, that item will be deemed approved. Okay. Uh, Mr. Chair, for the record, so we are approving the recommendations in the COs uh, that the CO uh, provided the amendments. We're approving the original recommendations in the HSC's committee report. Yep. And we're also approving the two um, recommendations provided in the HSC report that Ms. Barkley had indicated. Yep. Okay, thank you. Affirmative. All right. That uh, takes us to item number. Thank you, Ms. Barkley. Thank you. Uh, that takes us to item number 10. Item number 10 is a verbal report from the Los Angeles Homeless Services Authority on the 2018-19 citywide winter shelter operations. Good afternoon, council members. Paul Duncan with the uh, with LASA. Um, so giving a verbal report on the winter shelter this year and where we're at. Uh, this year is actually the first year of a three-year contract. So we went out for a re-procurement this year for our winter shelter program. So we have quite a few, a couple new providers and quite a few new winter shelter sites this year. Um, largely that is due to over the past several years, um, over the last three years, we've added over 3,500 year-round um, interim housing beds through both uh, the city and county uh, funding sources. So as that's happened, there were quite a few sites in the past that were winter shelter programs that have converted to year-round programs. So we've seen um, a shift in where we're uh, having our winter shelter programs operate. Um, and as part of that, we saw several challenges arise um, with the implementation of Directive 45 uh, from the fire department, which really clarified uh, the approval process for both winter shelter sites as well as temporary um, shelter sites for up to two years. And with that, we saw uh, a few delays and challenges within some of our sites that in past years have been able to operate as well as the new sites and getting up and going. Um, one positive thing as we went into this year, we were approved from the very start to have a 121 day operation. Historically, winter shelter has operated at a 91 day window from December through the end of February. However, over the last three years, we have come back and asked for extension through March. This year, we started um, from the very start with a operation date through the end of March. Um, additionally, as we look at the, um, the winter days and challenges on operations, each program site operates a 14-hour day However, each site receives 21 days worth of funding to have 24-hour operations if uh, there is going to be rain during the day so that program participants can stay inside and not have to return to the rain um, waiting to come back during the night. Additionally, when there is prolonged um, heavy amounts of rain, such as over the last four days, um, we have additional augmented sites. So currently we have an additional 100 sites at Athens that are operating to ensure that we can get um, additional people that might want to get out of the rain uh, in heavier periods and ensuring 
an increased capacity. So we open those on Monday night and they will operate through Friday morning. Currently we have 557 um, adult winter shelter beds operating. Additionally, there will be 47 Tay beds that open um, this evening. So we have gotten through the process and found a, a new site from the original proposed uh, Tay beds and they will be opening this evening. And then an additional 47 beds um, targeted to open Thursday, January 24th. Uh, and so once all those beds are open, it will bring the total beds for winter shelter to 651 beds within the city. Um, those beds are located within um, the council district 7, 8, 9, 11, and 14, which happens to coincide with um, each, of the, each of the council members on this committee. So. And that concludes my portion of the report. Um, before I wrap up, as a reminder to the committee members and anybody in the public, uh, the Los Angeles homeless count is next week, the 22nd, 23rd, and 24th. If you haven't, please sign up to uh, participate. All right, thank you. Uh, discussion members, Mr. Price, Mr. Rodriguez, Mr. Bonin. Uh, it's cold out and raining uh, and lots of people have uh, colds <laughs> uh, uh, <laughs> a lot of house people have colds um, in our district uh, in district eight uh, and i imagine this is around the city we had a problem with a number of winter shelters that had existed in years prior and uh, they ran into some issues with the fire department this year more than one uh, so I, I'm wondering, do you all, uh, did you all see this uh, broadly in the city? I'm, I'm hearing Ms. Rodriguez say they had that situation as well in the 7th District, and sort of what's being done to deal with that? We have been actively um, working with the fire department, the Department of Building Safety, um, the CAO, and the mayor's office to make sure that we can, as quickly as possible, um, address any of the situations around that. It did take, there were some challenges. Um, there were a few areas where we had to reduce the number of beds that were initially proposed to meet the standards set forth in Directive 45. Um, at the same time, we have been diligently working with our providers to identify additional sites to ensure that we're bringing up the, the capacity to what was intended amount through the funding. Uh, okay, thank you. It, it will, uh, in, in your next uh, report, it would be good to get an update on that. Because uh, I, I, I didn't have a sense of it would, if there was a trend or if, if, if it were sort of one set of things, if there was a broad set of things that were <coughs> um, impacting these, uh, the availability of these beds. The, within Directive 45, um, there are a set of things that are requirements to go above 50 people within a location for a winter shelter, a temporary shelter. Um, within several of our locations, they did not meet those requirements to go above the, the 50. And, and uh, if you don't know, it's fine, but uh, if you do know, I would love to hear uh, about how many beds do you think we lost in that process? And I'm saying, assuming a, per a, a group decides they just have to fall below 50. How many beds did we lose across the city? We saw a reduction of around 100 that we've Whoa. then partnered to find additional locations and bring them back on. But from the initial proposals at the sites that were there, it was about a reduction of 100 beds that we've been able to locate elsewhere. I see. OK, great. Uh, all right, thank you. Uh, if there's no further comment or questions, uh, we will uh, the report and uh, move to our final item. Thank you uh, so much for your work on this. Uh, and move to our final item number 12. Item number 12 is Proposition HHH Oversight Committee Transmittal. I'm sorry, Proposition HHH Administrative Oversight Committee Transmittal 
relative to recommendations from the Proposition HHH Citizens Oversight Committee regarding recommendations to improve the permanent supportive housing process and funding structure. Excellent. More fun stuff. Uh, no public comment cards on this item, so uh, you all have at it. Okay. Um, good afternoon. Yolanda Chavez with the CEO's office. Sean Spear, H -Sit. So the report before you are, is, uh, outlines recommendations from the Prop HHH Administrative Oversight Committee, uh, recommendations related to a pilot program to assess whether we can get proposals that will expedite the development and construction of housing. And the key recommendation is that we set aside $120 million from the bond proceeds for this program. So really what it would mean is that not that we would issue the money and reserve those funds, but that we would not issue that amount until we have projects under this program that we think we can fund. Um, but let me turn it over to HSIT since they will be implementing the program once the regs are um, finalized. Those regs will come back to you for approval before they're issued to the public. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, so basically I want to say that uh, to start off that this effort is actually really a result of the motion that you put forward last year as a committee to the COC, the Citizens Oversight Committee, uh, really charging them with the uh, the goal of trying to find uh, additional ways to make a bit, uh, use of the HHH resources in a more innovative uh, way that might be able to deliver units uh, both faster and potentially cheaper. So the recommendations that the Citizens Oversight Committee put forward uh, that the AOC and now hopefully you all will consider really reflect that challenge that came from you. And we appreciate your efforts in sort of figuring out do new and exciting ways to be able to move uh, new HHH projects forward. Uh, I think the key thing to also say is that, you know, the city family is very supportive of efforts to deliver the units more faster, uh, faster. Uh, in part that's, you know, the response to looking at the rec recommendations that came from the Citizens Oversight Committee was really a team effort in terms of the mayor's office, the CAO, and also us at HCIT. Uh, I would want to say that many of the recommendations reflect uh, actually um, um, ideas that are already permissible under the regulations. However, I think there are um, ways to, for us to more formally support um, new initiatives that can be helpful in the overall efforts to, to deliver units faster. So in part, uh, the response really looks at this as sort of a two-prong approach. The first would be to look at creating a crisis solutions team to speed the city permitting process and the related approvals that come along with that. Also look at better ways to coordinate amongst the uh, different departments that actually touch uh, HHH projects in one form or another. Uh, being able to, and then the second is looking at uh, the creation of a HHH innovation pilot program. So this would be essentially a program within the overall HHH program uh, designed to try and bring forward and hopefully attract uh, new ways of looking at delivering projects. Uh, that would be a, a competitive uh, call for projects. Uh, this would be focused on within it essentially two buckets that uh, uh, applicants could submit uh, proposals to uh, the city. The first would be uh, a, a project specific bucket. So this would be uh, similar to our regular call for projects that we issue for HHH, but with a set of additional uh, allowances uh, that would be permitted for projects that would be looking to compete in that bucket. The second bucket focuses on uh, programs that will ultimately deliver hopefully new additional projects. And so that would come with a commitment from uh, the city in terms of HHH dollars, but uh, with the goal that then they would uh, come up with a new uh, means to be able to uh, produce additional projects, and those projects then would come in in the form of loans uh, through H uh, HHH itself. Uh, all of this is really focused on the ideas of creating uh, units hopefully faster and cheaper. Uh, the goal, as Yolanda mentioned, was to produce uh, 1,000 units within this sub-program uh, over the course of the, with basically having a requirement that the, pro that the units would be delivered within two years of the commitment coming from the city. Uh, we are hoping to present uh, concepts to the COC Friday in response to the charge uh, put forward. Uh, along with uh, them presenting it to the AOC uh, next week. Uh, the goal would then to be able to um, 
create uh, draft regulations that would be put out for public comment, be able to receive those uh, comments, adjust the regulations as needed, and present a final draft to you all uh, for consideration uh, by the end of next month. Uh, from there, the hope is that we would release the call for projects in, in sometime in March with the goal of having the recommendations uh, presented to you all and the broader city council and mayor uh, before the summer recess. Include your summary? Yes. All right. Uh, discussion members, Ms. Rodriguez. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, well, I'm excited about this because I think we definitely need to identify new ways of being creative to uh, help really fully address the, the challenge that we're faced with every day. Um, in some of the conversation that we're having around the different typologies that we, you know, potentially are, are examining, whether it's ADUs and whatnot. Um, I just, part of my, you know, it's part of the, the drum that I beat to make sure that we are always assuring that the less service dependent, uh, you know, are going to be fulfilling that versus, you know, making sure that we have on-site services uh, to help serve the more, uh, you know, those that w are truly the permanent, the PSH kind of uh, model that we have developed. So I just want to make sure that we're always very aware when we have these conversations about assuring that, you know, in the Northeast Valley, we don't have this kind of over abundance of service providers that are meeting the, the various mental health and, and all the other service components that are required with some of the more, uh, you know, traditional PSH models. So I just want to make sure that if we're looking at those types of ADUs or whatnot, that uh, we are looking at a less dependent uh, population for that. Right. So, you know, I would respond, um, like I said, response is that the bond measure language is very clear in that 80% of the bond proceeds must be used for supportive housing that provides services on site. So I think when you all approved that language, it was at least, it was clear to us as the staff that your priority was to meet the needs of the chronically homeless on our city streets. And so 20% of the bond proceeds can be used for affordable. And so I think as you're describing, the ADUs really do meet that more as affordable, since you don't want someone who is maybe high acuity going to an ADU where they're not gonna get services on site. So we completely agree with you on yeah. that. Yeah. So I, I guess I, I would just follow up on that before going to Mr. Bonin. So, uh, I, I appreciate the agreement. I guess, can you say something about the mechanics, about how that will work, how you sort of know who's who and, and, and what's what? And I just, I ask that because there are lots of categories and no two people are alike, but there are people that we know that are short-term homeless <coughs> that maybe uh, need mental health services just to deal with the trauma of becoming homeless. And then after that, treatment, they're fine, right? So how do you distinguish them from a person that needs services for three years or right. eight years, you know, longer? So, so we leave that to the experts. <laughs> um, smart, as as smart. you know, all of the, all of the tenants, uh, the, the selection of the tenants for all of the Prop HHH funded units are done through the coordinated entry system. So these individuals have been evaluated, again, by the experts and ranked in terms of their needs. So for example, if there's a great ADU for a family that can move in very quickly, you know, doesn't need a lot of support, then that's, you know, perfect. If it's someone who has been chronically homeless and maybe has a disability, then it becomes those services should maybe be on site. And so that's how the tenants are selected. And I think in part, um, the, this process will still rely on the tenants of the overall HHH program, namely the partnership with the county in terms of the review of the supportive services plans that would be developed with the, each of the projects or the programs. So those things will still be re in place. It's really, I think to a certain extent, we're trying to figure out ways to uh, support the kind of bricks and mortar piece in terms of doing that faster and cheaper, but the overall projects are will still be expected to um, be reviewed and ultimately be in concert with you know, our partnership with the county on the service side. Thank you, Mr. Bonham. Thank you. Uh, I'm glad to see this uh, in front of us. Uh, people are frustrated and impatient and pissed off, and I'm one of them. Uh, 
uh, and we need to do things more, more quickly and, and less expensively. You know, earlier this week, I got a report that uh, a homeless person died in Venice, about midway between where I proposed bridge housing and where I have a permanent supportive housing opportunity site. And we're, we're just not moving fast enough, <clears throat> and so we need this. <clears throat> I, I appreciate the work that the, the, the CSC did, and I'm glad to see this. <clears throat> Happening, and you know, I hope that you know the, the approach we take is that 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 anything that someone over the past couple of years has, has has said stiffly, oh, we just don't do that. We're open to doing uh, in this pilot project. I mean, we, we really need to. Um, I'm fine with the recommendations. I want to make one small amendment uh, in uh, section B, <coughs> where we authorize H C C O City Attorney to work with the mayor's office up with detailed regulations. You list four things. I'd like to, to, to add a fifth, which the CSC did not recommend, but I think is, is vitally important, uh, which is that um, uh, units in the proposed projects uh, can allow for more than one person per unit. Yes. Yeah, one of the I'll things that, that is and actually and generally permitted under uh, regulations is the possibility of shared housing. Uh, so the key thing, though, is that we want to amplify that availability under this program. Yes. So you know, I, I just also wanted to give H said kudos because in 2017, when we first, when we did the first issuance of the bond, the city also experienced the highest construction cost or increase in the entire country, not just the state. And so, as a result, a few of the projects were delayed due to cost increases, but the first two projects will be completed in, I think, about August, September from the first issuance, so it's really almost 24 months from the time that we sold the bonds. And already they have over 3,700 units in the pipeline, which without HHH, you know, we wouldn't have been able to do that, but it's, it's, a, it's a tremendous amount of work for the department as well. And I understand that this last call for projects will add another... Um, 26 projects, uh, 1,700 units. 1,700 units, and so and we round. are, so in terms of committing the bond proceeds, we're gonna be over 800 million at that time when they issue the next yeah. set of letters of commitment. So that, I just wanna point that out because I think we don't talk about it enough. I think the other thing that's important to note that the average cost per unit is, has been in terms of the HHA subsidy, 157,000, which is I think something also that I think is lost. But, but it's still we the cost still, per unit. Yes. That, and that, that and it's, gives everybody heartburn. Well, it's 157, not half a million. So the but unit the may total be... total cost is, we're, our, our investment is Oh, yes. Our investment is average about 157. Right. Yes, but it's also the construction cost, right? And yes. that's going to sure. change at some point. And with no place like home, we have additional subsidy dollars. So that should hopefully help also reduce our subsidy. I, I, I appreciate the, the, the shout out to the department. I think that's appropriate. I, I think we don't do that enough. The other thing we don't talk about enough, though, is that in those two years, that guy who was sleeping mm -hmm. on the street, that's been over 700 nights yeah. that he or she's been sleeping on the street. And that's yes. the other frame we have to keep in mind. Yes, as uh, one of our leading activists pointed out, no one can live in a pipeline. So <laughs> <laughs> the pipeline is important. That's why we started the Bridge Home Program. Yeah, yeah that's yes, why we started exactly. the Bridge Home Program. Uh, so the pipeline's important, uh, but it, it, is, it is not the solution. I also thank you all uh, for following up on this and putting together a vigorous report and being uh, willing to take the risks uh, to think outside the box. Uh, you know, I started the meeting uh, talking about some of the things I was proud of that we accomplished during the time on this committee. One of the things that I worry about, and I have dreams of, of bouncing uh, LA Times headlines in my sleep, uh, of the $600,000 homeless apartment uh, in uh, South Los Angeles or, or the Northeast Valley or Wilmington or uh, anywhere else in the city for that matter. I just think we got to get beyond that and this helps us begin to crack, I think, open the box uh, to do that. So I appreciate that. Uh, I'll second uh, Mr. Bonnet's uh, amendment or accept it as friendly. Uh, and if there's uh, no further discussion, uh, Hearing no objection, uh, we will um, we will approve these recommendations, the AOC's recommendations, as amended. All right. 
Thank you all so much. Uh, I think that concludes our business for this meeting. Is that confirmed? Uh, yes, sir. That clears the desk. Excellent. We're adjourned. Thank you all so much.